1986, Fortune magazine wrote a huge article, 50 biggest and most powerful mob bosses in the country. So out of that list of 50, some 33 years later, 49 of them are dead. I'm the only one that survived. My name is Michael Francis, and I was a former capo, capo regime in the Colombo crime family back in New York, one of the five New York mafia La Cosa Nostra families. My dad was the underboss of the Colombo family. His name was Sonny Francis. My dad was a very highly publicized figure. He was a major target of law enforcement, had a lot of media attention. And I grew up uh, as a result of that actually hating the police, because I love my father. You know, I always saw them as the enemy, you know, trying to hurt my dad, trying to hurt my family. And originally, my dad didn't want this life for me. He wanted me to go to school, be a doctor. I was on that road until my dad got in some very serious trouble in the 60s. And in 1966, my dad was indicted in federal court for masterminding a nationwide string of bank robberies. After a lengthy trial, he was convicted. 1967, he was sentenced to 50 years in prison. He was shipped off to Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas to do his time and I was a pre-med student and when my dad went away I was devastated. He was 50 years old when he went in. Figured he had 50 on top of that, he'd never come out of prison alive. And at that time, Joe Colombo was the boss of our family. He kind of took me under his wing. I started to meet a lot of my dad's friends. They would say to me, Mike, what are you doing going to school? If you don't help your father out, he's gonna die in prison. So I was very impacted by that. I went to see dad and he was pretty upset. He didn't want that life for me originally. He wanted me to go on as a professional, but he knew my mind was made up and I was a pretty headstrong kid. He kind of threw his hands up, I'll never forget. And he said, all right, but if you're gonna be on the street, I want you on the street the right way. He says to me, go home, somebody will be in touch with you do whatever you're told, he actually proposed me for membership in that life. You can't just go up and tell somebody, hey, I'd like to join. Somebody has to propose you, they have to vouch for you, say you have what it takes. So in my case, it was my dad. Next uh, 18 months to two years, I was in kind of like a pledge period. I was known as a recruit. I was on call 24 hours a day. You had to do whatever you were told to prove yourself worthy to become a member. Halloween night, 1975, I was called into a room with five other gentlemen. It was a very solemn ceremony. The six of us walked into a room individually, boss seated at the head of a horseshoe configuration, walked down the aisle, stood in front of the boss, held out my hand, he took a knife, cut my finger, some blood dropped on the floor. He took a picture of a saint, a Catholic altar card, put it in my hands and lit it aflame. And he said, tonight, Michael Francis, you are born again into a new life, into La Cosa Nostra. If you betray your oath, you violate your oath, you're gonna burn in hell like the saint is burning in your hands. Do you accept? And I said, yes, I do. I took that all very seriously back then. It's a very serious life, and I take it seriously today, even though I don't consider myself a member of that life anymore. I was motivated to do two things. One, I wanted to get my dad out of prison, and two, I wanted to make money. I uh, was very aggressive on the street. I brought some new things into the family that hadn't been done before. So I devised a scheme to defraud the government out of tax on every gallon of gasoline. I ran that operation for about eight years, and at the height of my operation, I was selling a half a billion gallons of gas a month, and at one point in time, we were bringing in seven, eight, nine, ten million dollars a week. I had my own jet plane, I had a helicopter, I had a house in Florida, I had a house in uh, Marina del Rey, California, a house in New York. I had 300 guys under me ready to do anything I told them to do. I did get my dad out of prison after 10 years. He got out on parole. He kept going back. He was violated five times. My dad did a total of 40 years in prison on that 50. Today, my dad is released from prison. He's 102 years old. He'll be 103 in February. I'll tell you where I was in 1984 when things started to make a transition for me. I was probably at the height of my game. My father was grooming me to take over the family, boss on the boss, whatever way it worked out. I was indicted five times. I had two federal racketeering cases, one brought on by Rudy Giuliani. I was eventually acquitted in that case. I really had it going on at the age of 29. And among many things I was doing back then, I was making movies. I had a production company in LA, and Smokey Robinson was a good friend. He comes to me with a screenplay for a breakdance movie. So we made this movie in Florida, and uh, I brought in 50 professional dancers to work in the film. There was a young dancer uh, by the name of Camille Garcia. I saw her, and that was it. You know, it was like you had me at hello. And as a result of my falling in love with her and uh, us being so far apart, I mean, I'm this mob guy, and she's this young girl of faith. I knew if I wanted her in my life, I had to make some changes. I decided to try to walk away from that life. I didn't want to hurt my former associates, but that's not something that you do 
When you leave that life, it's considered betraying your oath and you can pay for it with your life. I was willing to take that chance. I took a plea on a big racketeering case involving this whole gas scam that I was involved in. I got a 10-year prison sentence. I married Camille. She's now my wife of 35 years. We moved out to California. I go off to do my time. As a result of that, I'm in a lot of trouble. Immediate contract on my life. My father at the time pretty well disowned me. He was very upset with what I did. I had law enforcement all over me. The feds wanted me to become a major informant, major witness. I didn't want any part of that. I had a very rough time in prison. I did five pretty tough years as a result of that. I got out after five years on parole. I'm on parole for 13 months worst 13 months of my life. You know, basically dodging bullets, a lot of trouble with the feds still, trying to make a living out in California. My wife and I at that point in time, we had two little babies, third one on the way. After 13 months, like a fool, I make a mistake. I fall into a trap, violate my parole. They send me back to prison, told me I'd never see the light of day again, I'd never be a free man. But I did uh, 29 months and seven days in the hole. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I was in lockdown. It was during that time that I became a person of faith, studied my Bible very much, and decided that I was gonna really try to make a transition in my life. For the last 23 years, I've been a uh, very prolific speaker, both uh, on a faith-based side and in a secular side. I speak all over the world. I've written four books. I'm on my fifth, and I've been extremely blessed to be where I am today. I told you in 1975, there was six of us that took the oath that night. I'm the only one alive today. The other five were all murdered. Taking that a step further, 1986, Fortune magazine wrote a huge article, 50 biggest and most powerful mob bosses in the country. It's out of that list of 50, some 33 years later, 49 of them are dead. I'm the only one that survived. So to say that I'm a fortunate, blessed guy is really an understatement. And you know, I attribute that to God having a different plan and a purpose for my life and me meeting this young girl, because if it wasn't for her, I'd either be dead or in prison for the rest of my life, without a doubt, like all my former friends and associates. You know, I have to say, during my time in that life, I was a committed mob guy, and I wanted to be the best possible mob guy I could be. I wanted to make my father proud, and plus I try to do my best when I'm doing something. But there were times in that life when I did things that I just did not feel good about. And I'm almost ashamed to say that I did them anyway. I saw people get killed for the wrong reasons. I saw people suffer for the wrong reasons. You know, unfortunately, you can't go back and change things. You can only hope that you can move forward and do better. The mob life should not be glorified. I always say it's an evil life. I'm not calling the guys evil, because I was one of them, and I don't judge people like that. But the life is evil because I don't know one family of any member of that life, including my own, that hasn't been totally devastated. So any lifestyle that does that to families is an evil lifestyle. You know, I just really want to encourage people that you can't come back from a bad situation. I mean, look, everybody predicted my death. When I walked out of prison, everybody, from law enforcement to everybody on the street, the important thing is you got to be held accountable. You got to surround yourself with the right people because in this life, you are who you hang out with. And I have a wife that holds me accountable. I have children that hold me accountable. I have a church that holds me accountable. And this is the way I stay on the right track. You can come back from a bad situation. You can defeat the odds. And I just want to encourage people to never give up hope in that regard.